Before I go on to another topic, I thought I'd do a one-off one uh, session for you, a special thing, on three great poems by my favorite, one of my favorite poets, uh, George Herbert. And George Herbert lived from 1593 to 1633. He died of pneumonia, uh, of tuberculosis, rather, sorry, of t tuberculosis at the age of 39. So he didn't reach his 40th birthday. Remarkable individual indeed. He lived in Elizabethan England, short life, as I say. Uh, came from Wales and went uh, off to Trinity College in, in Cambridge, ultimately, and became the college orator, which means that he was uh, wonderful at rhetoric and at communication and at writing and speeching, speechifying, as it were, would be. And he caught the eye of uh, James I. Um, his fame began to spread, and he was invited to the court at that time, and he had a promising career before him. It's not entirely clear all the things that took place, but a radical change took, occurred in which he decided, this man of such great giftedness and potential, decided instead to go off uh, south of Salisbury, if you're familiar with the Salisbury Plain and the, and the cathedral there, about 10 miles south, into a very obscure place, a parish, and he became basically a pastor of a church. He was a, a curate, rather he was a, um, um, a, a, a vicar of a church. And he um, lived in obscurity and in anonymity. They didn't know really who he was. And he was working on the cure of souls, help, serving people and working with them. And uh, when he died, he gave his book, uh, to uh, this book that he was working on called the, Te the Temple. And it was a collection of poetry that no one knew he was writing. No one knew about this. And it was, uh, he called it the Temple. It was a whole, the architecture of this poetry was like a temple. And as you go into the portal and you go inside and it's a, a wonder and a marvel. It's, he, it's that one little book that he gave to his friend Nelson Farrar. He said, here, you can either, uh, if you like this, uh, you can use it or you can have it burned. But it turned out that this, uh, Farrar saw the value of it, and it immediately uh, attracted uh, the attention of many. And the consequences are that this rich array of poems that have, have surfaced have so affected me uh, and so many others over the uh, thousands of, uh, uh, rather, 400 years. It's, it's quite remarkable. These are the poems that I myself loved uh, by him, um, and I, I put them in alphabetical order poem called Aaron, and one called The Call, Colossians 3.3, 3, um, The Elixir, Love 3, which is one of my favorites, uh, Justice, um, Man's Medley and Offering, uh, Paradise, The Pearl, Prayer 1, and The Pulley, Redemption, Sims Round, and Vanity, and Virtue. And those are the poems that I, um, I added to my poems to memorize. And so I, uh, I have, um, let me see, here we go with prayer one. So with this, this part of my collection of po poems that I have uh, learned, and then many of which I need to relearn, that's the problem. I, so I like them so much I learned 15 of his poems. I'm going to share with you three of them. And the three that I'm selecting are beautiful in the way that they work together and in, insofar as they ca encapsulate the whole of our own spiritual journey. The first one's called the pulley. And this pulley, I'll describe to you as to what it means as far as I understand it. But this, this genius here comes up with this wonderful image um, of, a, of a poem of, that describes the way that God reaches out and draws himself to us. Let me, let, me, let me tell it to you first of all, and then we'll work our way through it. And the reason why I start with the pulley. When God at first made man, having a glass of blessing standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can, let the world's riches, which dispersed lie, contract into a span. A span is nine inches, half a cubit. It's the length from your, th your, 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 your uh, thumb approximately to the end of your pinky. And let's all the world's riches contract 
into this one small span, like a bottle or something like this. So he, all, everything that is in the world then is contracted, and as he makes man, he's going to pour in him all these blessings. Let on him uh, pour in all we can. Let the world's riches which is first lie contract into a span, so strength first made a way. Then beauty flowed. Then wisdom, honor, pleasure. He's pouring these gifts out on his new creation. When almost out, all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that alone of all his treasure... Rest in the bottom lay. For if I should, said he, bestow this jewel also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me and rest in nature, not the God of nature. So both should losers be. Yet let them keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let them be rich and weary, that if le- least if goodness lead them not, Yet weariness may toss him to my breast. As I see this poem, it's the, an image of really what Augustine said in his first, at the end of his first paragraph in his Confessions, when he said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So the poem is about restlessness. You see the idea? It's the one gift he didn't give him is rest. Because if I gave him this, it would not serve very well at all. Let me show you what we're we're looking at now. So here we have then the first uh, stanza. So we see then this creation of his pinnacle of his created order, humanity, even above the angels ultimately. Although for now we do not see us as we will be, so we will be in which we, you and I, somehow, I don't understand it, will judge the angels. How is that even possible? And so here we see God making us and having an intention of giving him everything he could have except for one. And so he contracts everything that exists then and pours it on him like one who would pour something into a a, a glass and then give it to him. So strength first first made a way, which makes sense, doesn't it? Strength would always make a way first. It's the first one out. Uh, but then beauty flowed. And so the, the imagery, and I've, one of the things that I've been thinking about a great deal of late has been the whole notion of beauty and goodness and of truth. I, I do this a lot because it's, a, it's become a very meaningful uh, understanding for me. But I look at beauty and I'm now beginning to see through this lens. I used to have this, the, the, these transcendentals, as they're called. I used to put them in the order of truth, goodness, and beauty. I now make it goodness, truth, uh, goodness, beauty, and truth. And it's the reason for it is that that's how God approaches us, through the beauty of the natural world. And it is through beauty that it speaks to the heart. And that's why I love to consider beauty in music or in any work of art that draws the heart, you see, and uh, causes us to long for something more that we can have. The pro- and so we have this, as- because we are, are created in the image of God, we're aesthetic beings. Because we are uh, in his image, we are moral beings and we're also rational beings. Um, and so we see these, these, these three things that pull us and give us this sense of what uh, life is meant to be about when we consider his beauty and his goodness. So uh, beauty flow. Then wisdom, honor, pleasure. So all these great gifts that have been given to us and have been bestowed on us. Things for which people would kill. And yet God gives us as a grant. And he says, when almost all was out, God made us stay. He stopped. And he said, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna stop. There's one thing left here, but I'm not gonna pour it out on the man. He said, perceiving that alone of all his treasure rest in the bottom lay. I'm not going to give the creature rest. There's a reason for that, because you see, he makes it very clear. If I should, said he, bestow this, this jewel also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me. He would worship the creation rather than the creator. And rest in nature, not the God of nature, so both should losers be. It's not the way things were meant to be. It was meant such that we would see his beauty, his goodness, and his truth, 
and come to know him in this way. But if we were satisfied with all things, for example, if a person never lived, be, uh, never stopped getting older after the age of 20, let's say, it would be an interesting thing. We'd have a lot less concern about spiritual matters than we now do when age conspires with God to, to, to transfer our hope from the temporal to the eternal. So there's something not right there, not quite there, that needs to be satisfied. So he says, yet let him keep the rest. So he's using the word rest in an equivocal way because let him keep the rest, but also, but not the rest. You get the idea? You're not, he's not going to have rest, but he'll keep all the other goods that he's been granted. But keep them, I love this, with repining restlessness. Repining restlessness. If you stop and analyze your heart, you'll know that you long for something more than any earthbound good can ever sustain or supply. This just reminded me now, let's see if I can find it here, um, the um, weight of glory. Um, yeah, in the weight of glory, it's um, Lewis's great, great uh, uh, sermon that he gave. And he said the, the, this desire that we would have. Uh, in the end, that face, which is the delight or terror of the universe, must be turned upon each of us with either one expression or the other, either conferring glory inexpressible or inflicting shame that can never be dis uh, disguised, cured or disguised. He says uh, the satisfaction, he says, of being re the, the, beyond hope, learns at last that she has pleased him whom she was created to please. And so he describes this, this, not, this longing that we have. He says, the sense that in this universe we are treated as strangers. This is the restlessness. To meet with some response, to bridge some chasm that yawns be between us and reality, is part of our inconsolable secret. For glory meant good report with God, acceptance by God, response, acknowledgement, and welcome into the heart of all things. The door in which we have been knocking all our lives will open at last, which is a wonderful, uh, rich image, image that, he, that he sustains with that. So he, cannot, he, he speaks about how we want something else which can hardly be put into words, to be united with the beauty we see, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become part of it. He says... We cannot mingle with the splendors we see. So some longing we have when we are touched by beauty. But all the leaves of the New Testament are wrestling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. And I love that image there. See, ultimately, we will have that rest because we will have our rest, but it'll be in his presence and in his pleasure. And so he says this because he says effectively, God stoops to conquer. He's, he says, keep them with repining restlessness, that let them be rich, I love this, and weary. And how many people are rich and weary in this world where they discover that it is not wealth that sustains their heart's aspiration? That at least if goodness lead them not, yet weariness may toss them to my breast. So God stoops to conquer. He knows we're not going to come to him for good reasons. He knows this. He knows we're going to come to him almost as a utility in our desperate condition. He knows, so, it, so let it be, if that's what it takes. But my desire is they come ultimately in knowing me to love me for myself and not for my gifts and to find their true rest in the one who is the wellspring of all that is of true and good and beautiful. So it's a beautiful poem to me that I, I love to share with you because it speaks to me about the whole longing that we should have and this desire for seeing beauty in the world and longing somehow to enter into that. So this is a, a, a poem, and it, he never uses the word pulley in the poem. But the pulley is restlessness. It is something he uses and leverages it for his gain, you see, and draws us inexorably to himself. And yet the heart can respond and say no and decline the offer. It is possible to be a successful rebel even to the end. And so after a while, you can only decline the offer, the invitation, so many times. There comes a point, and it's a chilling word, that the heart can read a, reach a point of no return. And only God knows where that is. 
But there comes a point where you can only turn down the gospel and the offer of grace so many times. And God knows that where that heart is. But after a while, you see, we are becoming the kind of people, uh, one way or another, that uh, ultimately we will be in, in eternity. So this is one poem, then, that kind of draws me to it. I start with that because it gets us into the door. It gets us into the relationship. And uh, then we think about how do we cultivate and sustain the relationship. And that's where prayer comes in. And it is a, a poem about... Um, prayer itself about the beauty and about goodness and about truth. And this is an amazing poem. He uses 26 metaphors. I wonder if it's for each letter uh, in the alphabet. And no verbs in this poem, not a one verb. It's an amazing thing. One collection of one powerful image after another powerful image. And he's trying to draw our hearts into the mystery and meaning of what we call prayer. He's prayer, the church's banquet. Um, he, he's, he speaks about this, this the banquet, the, the, um, the, the souls, uh, as we look at it, let me, get, let me get it for you here, angels age, God's breath and man returning to his birth. The soul in paraphrase, heart and pilgrimage, the Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth, engine against the almighty, sinner's tower, reverse thunder, Christ's side-piercing spear, the six days world transposing in an hour, a kind of tune which all things hear and fear, softness and rest and peace and joy and bliss, exalted manna, gladness of the best, heaven and ordinary, man well-dressed, the, the Milky Way, the bird of paradise, church bells beyond the stars heard, the soul's blood, the land of spices, something understood. What is he doing with this? It's, it, he, for me, it's like a magic spell that he has. The imagery here, and I can only share in our time a few of the ideas in this rich, rich poem. But he speaks about it as the church's banquet. And so it is the Eucharistic image, is it not, of how we, we sup, and it's a table fellowship where we eat and have a communion with God, you see. And we do it individually and we do it collectively in prayer. It's the church's banquet. It's the angel's age because you see speaking about something that re re relates to the spiritual realm, the realm of eternity, the realm of the angelic uh, dimension. And now we participate in that. It's God's breath in man returning to his birth. So you go back to Genesis chapter 2, and he breathed into him and made him a living being. Remember the imagery there? He takes this clay and breathes into it. And God's breath in man now in prayer is being returned back to God, you see, in prayer. So what God gave, we're giving back to God. It's a reversal of that. It is the um, soul in paraphrase. What do you mean by paraphrase? Well, when you do a paraphrase, you're, you're trying to tease out what does the thing mean. And uh, you're taking a concept and you're uh, just processing that, that concept. So the, you're doing this, this paraphrase and you're chewing on and thinking about what life is about in this instance. Heart and pilgrimage. And you think um, of the Canterbury Tales, which uh, Herbert would have known, and with 30 pilgrims. And it's a whole pic picture, really, of the church's uh, and the response and the movement of pilgrimage to God, ultimately, in many ways. But the heart, we are all pilgrims. We are all wayfarers, exiles, aliens, and strangers. We're not home. We're in a pilgrimage, but we're heading somewhere to the celestial city. The Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth. I love that image. What's a plummet? Well, you know, they would sound the depths of the sea. And so they would actually send they'd, they'd, uh, a weight, they'd drop a weight down until they determined how deep were they so that they could know whether they were safe now to, to, uh, to get, put out the anchor. So you would plummet the depths. We use that term, don't we? Even now, plummeting the depths. But here it's a reverse thing. He's now plummeting the heights. So what he's now doing is he's going above, you see, and he's, he's now going, going above, and he's now plummeting up, upwards. So he's taking that line and actually going and connecting between ourselves and God in this uh, way. Instead of down the depths, it's plummeting the heights. And it's a 
beautiful metaphor. And so he speaks about uh, it sounds heaven and earth. It's, it's sounding the, the depths. Engine against the Almighty. What was an engine in with that concept of an engine? It describes in, in Scripture how certain kings like Uzziah, he had loved engines of war. What would be an engine of war? One would be a catapult, and another one would be a battering ram. And these were engines of war. These are weapons of offense. And an engine against the Almighty would be a time in which the, the person cries out against him or wonders, where are you, God? And you see this in the Psalms of Lament many times. It's an engine against the Almighty where we actually take the daring movement of a child crying to the Father and saying, why have you allowed this to happen? And so it becomes an offensive weapon almost, but it has a power. But at the same time, it's uh, the sinner's tower. So it's not only an offensive weapon, but it's a defensive image as well, where you can find yourself in a tower and your place of protection. And indeed, when you go to the top of a tower, you also get a perspective, a higher perspective looking down than you would otherwise. It is a reverse thunder. I love this idea of reverse thunder. Um, so when I think of thunder, um, we, we think of the lightning. If, You've ever been scared when you suddenly hear this crash that's so close to you? And it's a terrifying sound. And so it seems that you're dealing with lightning like this, but it's going back to heaven. And so in this reverse thunder, it is taking um, that lightning, that power, and sending it back to God, you see, reversing the direction of, of that lightning. So it's, a, again, to me, a very compelling image. Um, so he, he speaks about uh, the um, idea of uh, the sinner's tower, reverse thunder, Christ's side-piercing spear. So the most, these are metaphors, are they not of violence? But the most violent act of all was, in fact, the violence perpetrated against the, 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 the Son of Man. And so, and yet it's, and the spear was close to his heart. And so, in a very real way, our prayers speak to the heart of Jesus and are part of that as well. So he's looking at another angle of prayer. He's considering that concept. He's speaking also about the six days world transposing in an hour. So you take a, an hour of prayer, and it's like a transposition. What do you do in, in music when you transpose? You change the key. And so it's taking all that's done in the created order and you're now changing it into a new key and it becomes instead a kind of tune which all things fear and hear and fear. Uh, so that it becomes this melodic imagery as well so that there is yet another dim dimension to prayer, a kind of tune which all things fear, hear and fear. But then he changes it to metaphors instead of intensity. Now he focuses on softness and peace and joy and love and bliss. So there is this other dimension as well where there's a sense of intimacy, a sense of comfort that it provides, a softness, a peace. It's the fruit of the Spirit as well. So as we abide in the Spirit, we manifest that fruit. Softness and peace and joy and love and bliss. Exalted manna gladness of the best. So to take the manna that was sent down to us, we now are food, then now we give it back to him. So once again, you're giving it back to him in the prayer. And so it is a reversal of the, this order. Gladness of the best because every good gift and perfect thing comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom, in whom there is no shadow or shifting. So he, is, he gives us the best. Heaven and ordinary man well dressed. So heaven and ordinary, suddenly prayer takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. You see, you, you, you take the, and leverage the visible and the physical and the tangible, and through prayer, through communion with God, through responding to him, you can elevate your prayers then, and it becomes something that is uh, heaven in ordinary. Man well dressed, who told you you were naked? Interesting image, isn't it? And the whole idea of now being clothed with righteousness and the righteous deeds or the, the linen, the white linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So now we are clothed. We are well-dressed 
that we did not have, put off the old man and put on the new, the idea of uh, image of dressing, you see. Um, the Milky Way. And so this is why I had that up here before, because I'm so astonished by the beauty of the Milky Way, although I rarely get to see it in its real uh, clarity, because I'm generally in places where it's not very obvious. But um, in Herbert's time, and especially where he was living, he would have seen on a clear night the Milky Way, not quite as bright as this, uh, because this is amplified a little bit with uh, extra light, but nevertheless, you'd see this beauty and you would wonder, because the best thing you can do to get a sense of perspective is to lay on your back and look at the stars until you realize that you're not looking up, you're looking down, there's no up or down. And a little measure of humility that might be bringing about when you recognize that. So the Milky Way, um, the bird of paradise. And in the mythology, the bird of paradise had no feet because it would always be soaring in the air is the idea here. So the bird of paradise. Church bells beyond the stars heard another beautiful image. In, in here, in this earth, we hear church bells and it summons us, does it not, to prayer. In this, these church bells are beyond the stars, and they're summoning God to listen to our plea. Do you see the concept? So it's reversing that around as well. The soul's blood, because the life is in the blood, and so the soul's blood, its very vitality is in it. The land of spices, my word, I, I love to go to these souks where you see these great spices and the colors and so forth. It'd be it part of the genius is to figure out how to best use these things, you see. I mean, I don't even know what I would do with some of these things, but uh, they, they, they amaze me. And because there's something, a whole realm, and you see, remember the Queen of Sheba bringing him spices and things. So it's a very exotic image. The land of spices is a land that takes us away in our mind's eye to some place that you have not been, and it draws us and drives us to something extraordinary. Something understood, the last two words are powerful because it's a connection. He understands us. There is a connectedness between us and God. And so when I think about prayer then, these are ways in which I can exalt and extol the glory of God uh, through this manner. I, you know what I've been doing of late? It's very interesting. I've been taking this and using this very uh, prayer, this, this very uh, poem, and I've been kind of chewing on it throughout the day. So wherever I go, I can actually come and work my way through this poem. And it really has become a very powerful uh, array of images that helps me amplify my sense of God's presence and power and peace. Um, and so something understood, a connection is made, the power of prayer. And so there's so many things that one could do with that. The last poem I wanted to give you had, is, is um, a poem called The Elixir. And let me find that for you here. Uh, because The Elixir is um, a poem about the practice of, of our lives. And so what does that look like in terms of the pra practice, the power, the peace, the purposes of God? And so... Um, First, we start with the pulley where we're drawn to God, and ultimately our task is to, is to realize that he is the wellspring of all our ambition and our desires, to commune with him, to get to know him personally. And then in practice, put it in practice. So it is, in fact, loving well, it is learning well, it is living well. Here's where we're at the part of living well in the elixir. Teach me, my God and King, in all things thee to see. I love that and what I do in anything to do it as for thee. Not rudely as a beast to run into an action, but still to make thee prepossessed and give it his perfection. A man who looks on glass on it may stay his eye, or if he pleases, through it pass and then the heavens espy. All may of thee partake. Nothing can be so mean that with this tincture, for thy sake, will not grow bright and clean. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divine. Who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that and the action fine. This is the famous stone that turneth all to gold. For that which God doth touch and own cannot for less be told. Let's look at that and see how it would tease out in our lives. And so I take, take this first stanza, and this is an incredible and marvelous uh, image that ties everything together. Teach me my God and King 
in all things thee to see. Let me see you in everything I touch and do. And what I do in anything, so not only to see it, but also what he, what he does, to do it as for thee. So this one little uh, image here can be a powerful word to remind you that everything you do matters. There's no small people, no little places, no little events. Everything matters. So in all things thee to see and what I do in anything, to do it as for thee. Not rudely as a beast, not instinctually, not just in a perfunctory ma manner, but rather to run into an action. In other words, you need to have a mindfulness, an intentionality, an at attention, but still to make the prepossessed and give it his perfection. So he's saying, I want to do this not just instinctually, but intentionally. I want this to be a thing that I do, that when I am doing a thing to serve another person, if I'm at work, if I'm even putting a deal together, if I am working with a customer or a client, if I'm working with my neighbor, or if I'm playing uh, sports with someone, if I am um, engaged in any activity, whatever, it matters if I bring God into it, is his point here. So it's an intentionality to give it his perfection. A man that looks on glass on it may stay his eye. What's he talking about? Well, you could imagine that you have a window and you have a choice that you can make. You can either look at the window or you can look through the window. You can look at the window and see cobwebs or whatever or anything that's not perfect, perfect. And a man that looks on glass, on it may stay his eye or he has an option. If he pleases, through it pass and then the heavens is by. It reminds me of C.S. Lewis's meditations in a tool shed when he, as a boy, went into a tool shed and there was a chink of, in, the, in it and so the light was coming and the, it was floating around. You ever had that experience where it's, the dust is floating around in there? I remember that happened to me when I was at my grandfather's place in Monroe, Louisiana and I went into this shed and there was a chink and it was, uh, it was all floating and as a boy, I was drawn inexorably to something that I, I think most, many, many kids do. I didn't want to just look at it in the tool shed. I had to get it until I got to the end of it, and then suddenly, boom, it was a split second where it was no longer in a light of things floating around, but what was it? Suddenly, I looked through it, not along it. And then I saw the sun, 93 million miles away. I saw the, the sky. I saw the trees. You see the point? Suddenly, everything changes. You can, either look at it, you can either look at the window or you can look through the window. Your choice. And so you can begin to see that that window is there. You can look through it and then see God in all things. He says, all may of thee partake. Nothing can be so mean, by which he means ordinary, mundane, routine. Nothing can be so mean that with this tincture, and a tincture would, where, where they would take uh, material and then they would put it in alcohol and, um, and, and, and reduce it down and make it something that would be used. I remember a tinct tincture of methylate. I remember some of these things having those things. Um, a tincture, an elixir. He says, with this tincture, and the tincture is this, for thy sake. When you do it for his sake, the routine is no longer routine. The ordinary is extraordinary. There are no little people, no little places, no little events. But everything, when you do it with this tincture, suddenly grows bright and clean. It changes the rules, does it not? And then he uses what I think is the best metaphor you could imagine. Being in Elizabethan England, what would be the most thankless task you can imagine as by way of work that you can think of? Think of yourself now. So he's living um, in southwest England, around Salisbury, in the 17th century. And he's writing this probably around 1530, something right in there. What do you think would be the most unpleasant job or a thankless task? Well, there are plenty. One would be a charwoman. A charwoman, because they, you see, heated the, the, the houses with charcoal and also uh, they cooked with it. And so it would be necessary for having a person come into the house from time to time to sweep the, 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 the charcoal, to sweep the dust, and also to uh, do the, uh, sweep the chimney as well. 
and a, they, they call them a charwoman. Well, no one's going to be welcoming and have her for, for tea. It's actually kind of a bit of an interruption, but she comes in there and she cleans it up. And so here's the image he has. A servant with this clause, with this understanding, makes drudgery divine. He says, who sweeps a room as for thy laws, makes that in the action fine. What is he now saying? This is a very dramatic statement. Even though it seems to be a mean, ordinary task, everything changes when she does it as for the king, for thy sake. A servant with this understanding turns drudgery into something that is actually a service and an offering to God. Even though others do not notice, she will. And so, who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that and the action fine. As best as I can figure, I think that that and the action are referring to two different things. That has to do with the task itself. Suddenly, become, being a charwoman then becomes the equivalent of being the ambassador to France. You see what I'm saying? It takes the job and turns it into a great dignity. This is not an ordinary job. And turn, makes that, and then what's the other word? The action. I think it's the way in which she does the work. That she does this with such excellence and with such dignity that no one, although earthbound eyes won't appreciate it, God will. And so it now takes it and makes it a, a work offer of worship, you see. And it makes it act, that action fine. This is the famous stone that turneth all to gold. He's speaking about the philosopher's stone and the whole idea of taking the base elements and elevate, bringing them like, like lead. Uh, uh, gold is 89 on the periodic, it has an ma atomic mass of 89 on the atomic scale, on the periodic table of elements. I still remember, it reminded me of the fact when I was a kid, uh, I had a periodic, big periodic table of the elements in my bedroom. You see, I was, I was a scientific uh, Dork. And so, and I still remember it. So you had uh, gold 89, lead 92. So a little, a little heavier than gold. So the idea that somehow you could do it, that you could somehow take base things and to turn them into excellent. Well, that, there was no basis for that. And yet, on the other hand, there is an alchemy, as an alchemy of grace, in which you can take the base, the ordinary, the, the, the mundane, the routine, the thankless and turn that into the beautiful, the excellent, something that endures, something that is fine, something that is going to actually be elegant because you see, it turns it all to gold. So the alchemy of grace turns the lead of the ordinary into the gold of the extraordinary. And this is the idea that that which God doth touch and own cannot for less be told. So this gives you an idea of, of these three poems that I've used um, and to, to, to kind of describe this picture of, of George Herbert uh, in this manner. And I'm hoping this was of some value to you because as, as I reflect on this, it keeps coming back down to these three questions as well in these, in this, in these three poems. I've shown you these before. I'm using them a lot. And I'm inviting you to use these three questions now. The first question that he, was, that he asked was in John's Gospel. What do you seek? The second question that we have um, is in Caesarea Philippi. The third question is the last question, also John's Gospel. For the, so the first and the last questions are only found in God's, John's Gospel. What are you looking for? What do you seek? A fundamental question because what you seek will define what you find, what you become. You become conformed by that to which you aspire. And then the second question, who is Jesus for you now? Here's how I'm using these three. And I, I use them many times a day. Is now I can stop, or I don't have to stop. I can be doing anything. And I can just raise this question because we can think on two levels at the same time. Try this out. So what do, you, what do I, looking, what do I want more than anything else right now? Catch yourself right now. What do you want more than anything else? Secondly, who is Jesus to you right now? And then third, do you love him more than these? Now, you fill in the these. It could be your friends or your children or your, uh, your grandchildren. It could be your well-being, your prosperity. Do you love me more? Is there anything that um, is a rival to me? Because you see, as you know, if you love anything or anyone more than Jesus... You will love that person less than if you love Jesus more than them. 
So, but he will brook no rival. So these are, I find, powerful diagnostic questions that you can summon up at any moment, and it becomes a very powerful way of thinking. So what do you seek? Right now, what do you look for more than anything else? Who is Jesus to you right now? And do you love him more than any other good, earthbound good? And if you cannot say you do, do you want to love him more, you see? So it's a diagnostic tool that I use. I use that, and then the other thing I use a lot during the day is this, these three words. And so, again, these three poems, I find they all relate to these, these motifs of, of, of coming to know God, communing with him, and then... Uh, living in such a way that it's an expression of the relationship. So in any action, I can always stop and say, I want to trust the Father, I want to abide in the Son, I want to walk by the Spirit. And I find that this becomes a very powerful thing. I can do it while I'm in, in any activity at all. So I would invite you to try this out and to read these three poems as well. What questions do you have? Yes. Yes. Well, it depends, you see, because there, that's the interesting thing. What are you looking for? What do you seek? Because it could be that, but you may be seeking something else. You, that's, it's, what I mean by this is when I think about the whole idea of, of, of pleasure and power and so forth, and I, I think about the, the, uh, the, the various needs that we have for security and for, sig for, for significance and for satisfaction, um, it's often the, the, the danger that, um, that you have these, these needs that you have, uh, security, um, let's see if I can find you out, like this. So I say that the, 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 when I look at these, am I looking, who am I looking for for these three things? If I'm looking to people, we often do, don't we? And we often look to possessions for significance and position and performance for satisfaction. So in, say, in saying this then, I would rather say I want to find it in him. So my security is in the fact that the father has adopted me into his household. My significance is in, in the son uh, where I am part of something, the body of Christ will last forever. And my satisfaction is in the Holy Spirit. So he can give me those, those gifts in that way respect. Um, <clears throat> so as, as I see it then, that's, that's what I, how I use these, these questions. What do you want more than anything else? And uh, do you seek him? So it could be who do you, in fact, at the end of the day, it is who do you seek? Because it, it's all about him, isn't it? When you stop and think about it, what you should seek is him. Who is he to you? And what do you love more than anything else? Because there'll always be a challenge of the visible occluding the invisible. So I hope this was of some help. Yes, Jay, Jay. Ken, I have no doubt your analysis of those poems is spot on. I was curious if in his original work, did Herbert say, give any of that himself, or was it just a poem? It's a poem. So I'm, un I'm unpacking it and uh, doing my best to do that. But at the same time, the, I can't grasp the full depth of, those, of that poem. I mean, when I, when I look at uh, some of his architecture um, and uh, realize um, it, it, that like, for example, here's an example of a poem that he wrote, and it's so, I won't go into it, but I love to pull this off because it's got a hidden message in it, and the whole message is, says that he, we can see things in two different levels, and here's the hidden message. Uh, I always love doing this. So the very structure, because I didn't even talk about the structure of it, and that, that it was a modified um, um, <clears throat> sonnet, and all the rhyming structures that he uses, elegant. My life is hidden, him that is my treasure. That's pretty impressive. See, and, you, and what you, the whole poem, poem is you don't see it, yet it's there. And so the guy was brilliant. And I look forward to having conversations with him in the ages to come. <laughs> Let us close with a prayer since I fear that we are out of time. But, uh, Father, we thank you for this uh, time we can share with you. And I ask you that uh, you would cause us to ask these questions again. Um, <clears throat> what do we seek more than anything else? What do we long for? Um, and my desire would that it be you, O Lord. And that my desire as well is to have a bigger vision of Jesus. Who do you say that I am? And the bigger that vision, then the choice to love more than any of these other goods and to realize 
that he is not the enemy, but the animator of those relationships. We pray in his name. Amen.